Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our guest speaker for the next hour, uh, Mr. Morgan Roman. Um, Mr. Roman works on the application security team at DocuSign. He's passionate about finding ways to automate security testing and make it part of the deployment process. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Roman to the stage. Uh, hey, everybody. Like I said, my name is Morgan Roman. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Uh, you are all free to come closer. It's not particularly packed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, what we're going to talk about today is basically how to get your developers to stop running with scissors and, you know, stabbing themselves in the face. And the main concept behind this is a lot of the frameworks are built in with some major security, I wouldn't say flaws, but easy ways to shoot yourself in the foot. And you want to make sure that they avoid that. So first off about me, I work on the application security team at DocuSign. I want to give special thanks to all these people. They helped make this talk in either directly or indirectly. And it kind of comes from the idea that we were tired of playing whack-a-mole with bugs. And th thus is why I have this picture of myself at RSA playing whack-a-mole at a vendor stand, because that's what you do at RSA. And also, I want to make one big note. No, these are examples may use a particular framework or one that you're not familiar with and all this sort of stuff. I'm particularly partial to .NET, but the strategy itself that I'm going to present is not particular to any framework or library. All right, so the problem. The developers are trying to get from A to B. Can anyone tell me what is the shortest distance between A and B? What's the shortest way? Straight line. All right. Voila. This I like to call the easy way. Anyone want to guess what the secure way would look like? Just imagine it in your head. I sort of imagine it like this. You have to do some validation. You have to do encoding, maybe some logging. You have to do a lot of checks, maybe you know, all sorts of stuff going on. And the ultimate problem is the secure way is not the easy way. Pretty simple. Solution is you just make them the same thing. You make the easy way the secure way. It's a kind of simple idea. Don't worry, I won't patronize you too much. But yeah, this is basically how developers work. This is bad, so I need, I'm going to make sure I'm not going to patronize you all very much. This is good. Everyone repeat after me. Bad. bad. Come on. Bad. Good. <laughs> See, I didn't patronize you all at all. Anyway, so this is why you would do this. You don't want developers to really hate you when you say, hey, don't use this thing, use something else. Don't you know, make it really easy to have, say, XXE or any other kind of vulnerability. And you'll need a lot less developer training when you use this strategy. And your training will be way more effective. And you want to also have this work together so it won't impede development. So they don't have to make this decision here, because this guy's having a rough time. So my strategy is not new. In fact, it's very old. And I want to go over some existing examples of this strategy that we already see in the industry. In fact, the earliest example that I'm not going to present on here, because it would go into too much depth, that I know of, right? There's probably even earlier, earlier examples, is when Microsoft had a bunch of banned uh, C APIs, where they said, hey, don't use these. Use something else instead. But I'm going to show a little bit easier ones that are more web app focused. So first one is, thanks to React, and thanks to most of these new JavaScript frameworks, there's a lot less XSS than there used to be. I mean, there's still, you'll still find it. But by default, it's encoded. So by the standard way you use JSX, which is the templating language essentially for React, is you kind of get this, right? Some user input, and you put it in here. But if you really, really absolutely want to you know, make it unsafe, what I really like is it's called dangerously. That's amazing. Because all of a sudden, the developer's like, oh, I have to do something that isn't the obvious way. The easy way is the secure way. It's great. The next thing I, I want to show you is that this is the joys of string concatenation. So dynamic SQL is essentially the root of all SQL injection. There's probably other examples, but this is essentially the root of all of it. And if you use an ORM, which is an object relational mapper, which kind of abstracts out all the SQL for you, most of your calls will kind of look more like this, right? 
So instead of having string concatenation here, where you get you know, nice little tidbits like this, uh, you actually have it by default you know, not breaking out of the SQL grammar. So the result is, hey, if this is the normal way I ask, you know, select star from wherever, um, then I'm not going to make this mistake. You just rule that out. And that's why I really like ORMs if I'm trying to make something more secure. Because by default, you're not going to screw it up. And you want to really think about this. The developers didn't just, you know, want to make it insecure. They just wanted to query the database. And then they end up having this mistake. Here's another example of where this was unsafe before and then they made it safe by default. So parsing XML is a great idea, always, because XML is effectively Turing complete. Um, and you have these things called DTDs, where you have document type definitions. For all of you, quick raise of hands, do, who knows what XXE is? Sweet, you're a great audience. Uh, okay, so XXE basically means that you have an XML document, and then part in, of that XML document at the top and sort of the header, so it's called the DTD, the document type definitions. I always forget the name, meaning of that acronym. Essentially, in there you can set any variable you want, and it could be somewhere on the file system, it could be somewhere on the internet, and it'll make those calls to either the file system or the internet. And that's pretty useful if you're an attacker because then you can say, okay, I can read from the file system, and all sorts of nasty stuff like that. So by default, because the XML specification says you can do this, you then have this happening. And attackers could just exploit that by default in, in .NET. But in newer versions of it, they just made it, turned it off. And if you want to turn it back on, you have the option to do so, but it's safe by default. The easy way is a secure way. And yeah, you just read from the file system for fun and profit. And the one thing I want to hammer in is they just wanted to parse XML. They didn't want to shoot themselves in the foot. And by the way, if there's a bug that like, you all don't know, just raise your hand and I'll explain it. Feel free to interrupt. So this is the main idea. You want to make the easy way the secure way. So how do you make it easy? And I'm literally going to give you basically how you find the bad pattern, how you make the safe pattern the default one, and even the exact words to use to train the developers, and then the kind of tools you can use to enforce these new rules and make it extremely simple. Because I like simple, actionable things. I don't really like too much theory around this stuff. So let's talk about Redos. Who here knows what Redos is? Sweet. You want to explain it? It's a form of uh, exponential batch tracking that allows a regular instruction to consume all of a few resources on the system. Yes, that's awesome. I would give you candy if I had any. Um, but what he said is essentially that with exponential backtracking in regex, so basically you make a reg regular expression that takes exponential time on the process, or thread, whatever, it doesn't really matter, and you just extend up, end up ex expending too many resources, and then you have a denial of service attack where you're uh, consuming all the threads on a server, for example, right? So the safe way to do it is when you're doing using any regex, and you could just pretend this is some user input or something that isn't totally obviously malicious here, um, you just wrap it in a timeout. So if a developer forgets to wrap it in a timeout, you might want to say, hey, wrap your regex in a timeout, and we're good. Um, if they forget, though, you have to remind them. And also, you have to explain that, and then they also have to decide the timeout. It actually gets more, it gets annoyingly complicated when they're fixing these things, right? Because, like, what's the right timeout? Well, you're like, well, it doesn't matter. It's like under an hour, fine, right? That sort of thing. So. This is what I recommend. Now, this part, you only really want to write once. Um, it gets kind of technical if you don't know C-sharp. But in this case, you essentially inherit from the base regex class. I actually use this where I work, um, except it's a little bit sanitized of any work information. Um, you know, my safe regex class. And then you have a default timeout, which is you know, one second. Um, and then you just inherit from the base class and then make the, the default timeout by default. Right? So one second timeout and then you inherit it so it would do the default timeout. But if you're not an engineer and you don't want to write this, find someone who can and you just write it once and then use it everywhere. So this is the exact wording I would use in this sample training. I'm not going to read it aloud for you, but I will give you a template. But essentially, you explain what could happen and then 
what you should do instead, and then you have a good example on what not to do, because that's usually what the developer's looking for, and then you say what to do. And you usually want to make it about the same length and just about as simple. So here's the exact wording, and this is a slide to take pictures of, right? If you use the bad way, bad thing will happen. Instead, use the good way since it stops the bad thing. Literally, this is some ad lib. You plug and play for like any training that you want, and it works. It's magic. Um, do not do this, and then you show the example. Do this instead. And there's actually like some, I have some rules about this. Don't use any uh, acronyms, right? Unless like it's very obvious to whoever you're talking to, right? So there's a lot of security lingo like XSC, Redos, XSS, et cetera, et cetera. Don't use any of that. Also, have the, like I said, show the example of what they didn't, they should not do first, and then show it what they should do correctly. Because oftentimes the developer, when they're reading through it, uh, they're looking for kind of what they're doing more than what they should be doing, which is a kind of a weird psychology thing. Everyone cool? Me moving to the next slide? Oh, yes, and if you really want, you could add, you know, some links to OWASP and other good resources for people who are curious about it. But it's a very, very quick and simple way to move on, to uh, train people and have it extremely quick. So when should you do this, though? And that's a big question when you should train the developers, because I gave you the training. Okay, what would be a good time? Anyone have any ideas? No one wants to be a volunteer victim? Constantly? All the time. Every day. Man, if you, if you could get that to happen, they wouldn't cut off your head. When they least expect it. I like it. <coughs> they need something done. That's a good thing that I will use for a segue into something. Basically, when they get access to the repository for the project. That's my favorite time to give them start. So if you have like a company with lots of repositories or lots of projects, when they get access to be able to commit code, it's like, hey, for this specific project, because it's in Java, we have our little thing for here are the mistakes you make with Java, right? That's my favorite time to do it. The other times I like to do is have it once a year, just retrain for their specific area. Um, more just have the consistency, but you could do once every six months or any sort of, you do every day if you want. <laughs> and that just prevents you from being this kind of security guard because he's really effective. So let's talk about code analysis. Let's talk about the simplest way we can do this. Control F, find things. My personal favorite, now you can use whatever you want for this stuff, you could put grep behind a bash script, but I like this tool called get, uh, DevSkim. Uh, DevSkim is free from Microsoft. It's basically grep with a JSON config. Um, and you can use whatever you want, but essentially you could do something like have this pattern and then look for this pattern, let me know if it's ever been used, and here's an exception. So if you find that pattern that matches some other pattern, then I could you know, say that's okay, right? And if you really want to do more complex, we can go into some tools like Rosalind or do other sort of more complicated static analysis. You probably can find whatever you need online. But I'm a huge fan of the really simple, just throw some regex in there and see what you find. And in fact, I'll show you the config that I like to use. So this is some JSON, very readable by everyone in the audience, I can tell. Um, but I want to focus in on a few things. One, I have a very simple pattern. I aim for about only 80% effectiveness for finding this stuff and just say, okay, you're just using like the base regex class. That's not cool. But you then have a good explanation and then you also have your exclusions here that say, oh, you're using the safe one. That's totally fine. We're good, right? So good explanation, usually something like that says, hey, please contact so-and-so for this. I also like to add in there. So when to use this, um, there are some good choices here. One is inside the IDE or whatever development tools they're using. I've found that difficult to get adoption uh, because many times people just have every, every developer has their own one for some reason. Um, and every team has their own subset. So I will, if you could do it, great, but if you can't, so be it. 
Um, I find that during pull requests is a great time because usually the developers are open to feedback. So if you add this as like a Git um, webhook, um, I think that's what it is, then that's definitely the right time to do it. And then if you include that as your CID, CD pipeline, you have that problem solved. And then every once in a while, maybe once a week, once a month, you run this on your entire code base just to find this, you know, stuff that didn't get picked up for some reason or, you know, historical things. So let's go over what we just did, and then I'll go through some more examples a lot faster. First, you find the bad pattern. We said, hey, new regex blah, that is open to a, a redos attack. We made the safe one the default one. We said, okay, here's my safe regex, and we wrapped everything in a timeout. Then we trained the developers, and I gave you all the, um, basically a, a template for training anybody for anything. And then build tools, Super grab, right? And that tool is enough to find like 90% of anything. You might need for more advanced chain analysis, fair enough, but for stuff like this, I'm a huge fan of DevSkim or grep, honestly. Easy. So, let's talk about XXE. I we talked briefly about XXE earlier, but essentially bad XML. Here is an example inside Java, where to turn this off, you have to do this set feature thing, and this is very weird to remember every time you're parsing XML. Well, because this is Java, everything's a factory, so what I decided is, well, why don't I make my safe XML parser factory and follow the exact same pattern as the developers are familiar, familiar to using. And I just want to note that I'm not picking on this parser for any reason, it's just the one that came up. So, what kind of training would we use? Sorry, I need to clear my throat. I have a bit of cold. <coughs> if you use the standard XML parsers, then you'll allow an attacker to control the server through the DTD, blah, blah, blah. It said use my safe one because it blocks the attacker from setting the DTD variables, and voila. You have the exact way to tell them what not to do and what to do instead. So same exact wording for the training. You just show an example, and yeah, Gandalf's happy. All right, so to enforce the rules, I just created this uh, new uh, DevSkim rule right here. Once again, use the static analysis tool of your choice. This is just the one I like. Um, and you know, you write some simple regex. In this case, I have to do some weird escaping. But other than that, fairly simple, and you have the problem solved, and you just add it to your CID, CD pipeline. Uh, I want to break real quick. Does this, anyone have any questions about this particular part right here? Or? Is that clear? Cool. Come on. All right. So we did the exact same four steps. We found the bad pattern. We made the safe one the default one. We used the same training and the same sort of rules. I'm going to repeat myself a lot. You guys are going to get excited. So let's actually go through this imaginary email. It looks totally legit. Anyone want to tell me what could possibly not be, you know, there's nothing wrong. Tell me what's, what's the thing that's totally not wrong with this? Anyone? The link? He said the link. Everyone agree? I'm not sure. I think it might be totally okay. You're laughing. All right, the link is totally messed up because this is what we call an open redirect. It's like, yeah, redirect to some evil phishing site dot, dot com. And you know, yeah, Mr. Robot, this will totally protect you from him. So open redirects, you, the dangers of these is you could trick users to going to malicious phishing sites thinking that they're in some banking website. If you don't block the protocol, you can even get XSS, and we often recommend people to use a whitelist. And once we're in time, we're gonna ask for audience volunteering, and I might do some voluntolding. Um, let's play spot the bug. Anyone can tell me what's wrong with this. I, I told a developer to put their redirects behind a whitelist. And uh, yeah, this is what they wrote. That's a good point. It does a partial match because this is regex and sort of like it contains.
So what kind of URL could you put through it? Gotcha. So he said it doesn't do a full match, and you could probably have a subdomain of that site or another site that has like my safewhitelist.com dot blah, right? Uh, there's some other bugs. Anyone have any other idea what's broken with this? No one? All right. Yeah, that doesn't. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So also you could even do, what other kind of URLs you could use with that? Subdomain. Yeah, or query string or paths. Yeah. Not protocol checking. There we go. Nice. Well done. So here, yeah, that's bad. And here are some examples. You've all kind of got that. So, hey, some subdomain. Also, put in the query string or path if you want because there's no end-to-end -end checking. It's effectively a uh, does contain. And hey, no protocol, so whatever. Just alert something for fun. There's also one other thing, the dot. In regex, that's wildcard. So you could do this, right? You just put whatever you want there. That's my favorite one when I find these. So how would you block this? What sort of safe version you could do? Well. I happen to know that, no. Um, basically, what, I, what I've done for this one is we have a internal redirect method, right, which just says, hey, blocks non-HTTPS protocols and only allows redirects to our safe sites, right? And if it's not that, it's gonna block it, it's just not gonna work. And the nice thing about it is you can just assume that these are all safe, right? And then an external one, you block the protocol and then you require that they put a whitelist. Now, later you can audit the whitelist to make sure it's okay because there's really no good way of doing that automatically that I know of, but it does actually reduce the amount of surface area very nicely and reduces the amount of bugs that you'll have here. And to show you the rules for this, I have this pattern that says doing, so this is for like an example for some JavaScript, right? So if you're matching like a node server or something like that, um, you know, redirect and then this kind of abomination right here. But hey, are you using this sort of method right here. Instead, you should use the pattern of safe redirect, whatever class you decide to call it, or library, essentially. And then, I only try to aim for 80% with these, because the rules will otherwise get way too complex. And then also, I have a slightly lower um, priority one, which is saying like, okay, if you're using external redirect, then it's not it's not a hundred percent chance that it's a bug, but someone should take a look at this. So you would have some external alerting for that, which is extremely valuable. So yeah, like this is definitely a bug, but this is like, okay, this is just interesting for us to look at. That kind of two-tiered static analysis, you could say. All right, server-side request forgery. Who here is familiar with that? Sweet, we got the pros. <laughs> now, it, it's pretty simple, essentially, you have a hacker, they're happy. There's a vulnerable server and there's a victim server, right? And they wanna to talk to the victim server, but it's behind a firewall. So instead they call the vulnerable server and they tell the vulnerable server to talk to the victim server and send whatever packets they want, right? Or whatever messages they care about. <coughs> there's a couple other nasty things you can do with this. Uh, occasionally you get file rights on the vulnerable server, which is really fun, uh, depending on what they're doing. So that's kind of cool. And it's, it's pretty awesome because you can kind of say, well, let's pretend only this ser victim server only trusts the vulnerable server, and anything that comes from there is therefore trusted. You can kind of like gain privileges, which is quite cool. And this scary little girl will hack you if you have this problem. So what can you do with this server-side request forgery in C-sharp. So for those of you who are not familiar with C-sharp, sorry, um, but for those 
just kind of imagine what sort of nasty things you could do with this. Totally user controllable. Give a shout out. What? Yeah. Let's pretend you call a server you own. What would you see on that server you own? get the IP or maybe it sends a token or something like that. Definitely. Sorry? Oh, no one said anything? I thought I heard a ghost. Call internal cloud APIs. Call, call internal cloud APIs. Yeah. I mean, call internal IP addresses. You can even call these external services with long responses, so it's a good denial of service uh, vector. And you can even do a file read. In Windows, this is totally fine. Okay, totally fine, right? Which is quite nasty. Um, and you can even do a file write occasionally. That's scary if you're doing like a post. So I have taken down a site by accident doing this. Full disclosure on that. Luckily, I didn't get in too much trouble. Um, so sometimes this needs to happen, right? The, by design, the application must perform web calls and it must be somewhat user controlled. You wanna limit the exposure for this, essentially. And this is a horrible, horrible acronym, but I had to make you all suffer through that. And, uh, but what you can do to protect yourself is block internal IPs, have a built-in timeout to prevent dial service, and then this is a little bit more Windows-based. I don't know, maybe Linux will also have it, but I'm not as familiar. But you can block calls to the file system and make sure the protocol's right. So this should never do FTP, for example, that sort of thing. And for those of you who see this horrible acronym, local file inclusion to lead to remote code execution. So you set up a safe version that inherits all the features of your web client library. So very similar to what you saw before with the regex library. Whoops. Uh, missing something. And you essentially block all this information here. Any questions about this before I go over a recap? Cool. So to cover what we've talked about, and like I said, I, I'm planning on repeating myself a lot, is basically this is a very simple process that can be used to tackle tons of bugs. The first thing is you find the bad pattern, and the way you can figure out if you can use this tactic is you can find what's called like a, a sink, a very common endpoint where everything boils down to. All redos must, must go through some regex. All server-side request forgery must have a web call at some point, right? All um, open, re open redirects must go to a redirect, those sorts of things, right? So you find a common sink, right? So in these cases, you kind of see, hey, all, um, XML parsing must have, must have the XML parser, that sort of thing. And then when you have all of these, you're like, okay, I know I have a sync. I can probably use this strategy because that can make the sync safe, right? You make a safe pattern the default one. So you make your my safe whatever class, right? You, you want to wrap it and make sure it has all the same features so the developers are happy and you make it very simple to use, right? And if they really need to do like a extra kind of special timeout or whatever sort of thing to modify around it, you give them the ability and maybe even have some alerting around that. And speaking of that alerting, you then want to train the developers to use the safe, the safe pattern. So you definitely want to, I highly recommend you use this script because it just saves time instead of writing your own. Um, but do what works for you. Um, and definitely it's, simple enough and they know to follow it rather than explaining, hey, don't forget the timeout, don't forget this thing, don't forget to check for this thing, it's just say, use the safe version. And always include examples because otherwise they'll be very confused. And then you have tools to enforce the rules. I like very simple static analysis tools, that's just my personal preference. Um, and I think my personal preference is right. No, um, and I aim for just 
getting about 80% there and keep these at a regular cadence so that way I can watch and monitor for these things. And yeah, very simple rules. So once again, recapping on the recap, find the bad pattern, make the safe pattern the default one and train the developers to use the safe pattern. And then finally build tools to make sure that these remain enforced. And then you make the easy way the secure way. And that's the main idea here instead of making it convoluted and hard. Anyway, thank you all. This is my email. Uh, if you have any questions or if you want the slides and I'll post them online later. Cool. Yes, uh, you first. Uh, people might start using new ones that you don't have rules yet, so you can, so I guess is there an authoritative, an easy way to find everything that everybody can potentially do badly with a given framework or library or language? I mean, you know, you can sit there and spend a whole bunch of weeks analyzing a particular, you know, library and, and all the terrible things that could be done with it, but that's quite time consuming and hard to maintain, so is there like? For, for that particular tool, is there a like, set of rules you can download for a given library or framework? Uh, so his question was, oftentimes uh, organizations will use lots of different libraries and then new team, or teams will decide to use a new framework or a new language. Uh, and so it's very time consuming to write custom rules for each one. The answer is yes, it will. There are built-in rules that you can download for even DevSkim um, and most other static analysis tools. The issue I take with that though is most of them are not very good um, at finding these sorts of things. Uh, what I would advise to, as sort of a time saving measure, because that seems to be what you're most concerned about, is hey, I want to prioritize my time, I want to make sure that I'm not wasting time for every little thing, is find your like most common bug and be like, okay, there's tons of XXE inside this application, or there's tons of open redirects in this application. How do we just solve that problem? And that'll solve maybe a quarter of our security bugs that we know about, right? That's what I would recommend for this strategy rather than trying to whack every single one. Does that help you out or, yeah? So, um, this might be a part question or part comment to the last question, but um, there's a CI service called LGTM, short for looks good to me. Um, I, I found that it does sort of what he's talking about, that it finds the bad patterns and then recommends the, the good pattern that you should replace it with. Have you looked into any other tools um, that do that, that sort of thing, or is, it, is that still new in the, the CI uh, world? Um. I actually have, so he was talking about that there are tools that do this say use the bad, don't use the bad pattern, use the good pattern. Uh, that particular one I had looked at a while ago and uh, perhaps they've changed but I wasn't particularly impressed at the time for what I, for what I saw. Um, though I did actually like kind of the, the pattern that they were trying to do, I just didn't find the things I was looking for. So this is great with this secure wrapper, but how do you measure the effectiveness of this? Are you collecting usage stats on library polls or? Um, good question. So how would you, do you measure the uh, effectiveness of this sort of library? The first thing I kind of do is I'll just say, how much is this, the old library being used at all? Okay. And then you just have a good baseline right there. Right? So let's say 100 times, you just say, all right, how many of the old ones, of these old ones, how many have we fixed and just moved over? So that's the first thing I would do, right? And sometimes things need to be like, okay, there's you know, some reason that you, they can't use the current library because there's some bug or something like that, that sort of thing. Um, so be it, that's the good first metric. And then if you do this on a regular cadence, what you can kind of see is, oh, did I find any new ones that got merged in that were wrong? That's why I like the dual scan during PR and scan weekly or monthly because PR should block everything, theoretically, uh, but it's not guaranteed. Does that help your question? Yeah. Yeah. 
and then you had one as well. Do you have any thoughts on, for languages that allow it, monkey patching the original uh, library or class and then either intercepting the behavior directly and using the safe method or at least alerting on that so that you can find those usages and replace them um, with a warning to the developer? You mean like languages like Ruby where you can overwrite the base class? Yeah. yeah. So he was talking about where you can essentially monkey patch or overwrite the base class to do whatever you want. That's a fantastic way of doing it, actually. Okay, I like, didn't know if you had any like negative impact on that or? I, I mean, if the development team, team is open to that, go for it. But most of the languages that I work with, they, you can't do that. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you all.